Hi, Nick. Good morning. Let's talk Citizen Lab. Um, first and foremost, I'm super, super, super fascinated by the, the work that you guys are doing. I really, I really feel this is something in, uh, in the times that we live in with, with a lot of polarization and, and a lot of extremes on both sides. I think what you guys are doing is really part of the, of the way forward and the solution. So I just want to express my gratitude for all the, the energy you. and effort that you guys put into this. Um, we typically start with some human connection questions, right? So that the audience can build up some connection with you and uh, and get to know you. Um, so I was wondering, what is your what was your proudest moment of this year of or maybe of your life? My proudest moment is um, for sure being able to work on social good while doing business. It's for me as a as a as as a student, it was my dream to become an entrepreneur, but not just any kind of entrepreneur, but to actually be a social impact entrepreneur and to do good, to contribute to a better world, while at the same time, of course, um, running a business, running an organization, running an organization and making money to be um, independent and self-sustaining. And I feel for me, that's like a, a dream that came true. We're now an organization of 50 people. Um, and that is kind of the, probably the, 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 the proud moment that follows from it is that I've got the privilege to work with 50 brilliant people from 20 different nationalities who are all wow. very intrinsically motivated and passionate about the topic and what we're doing, uh, who want to work on like a better governance, who are passionate about democracy. And it's just so much fun to be able to work with people that you don't need to motivate because they are self-motivated. They know why they're doing it. Um, and you can learn from each other because you come from different cultural backgrounds, different nationalities, different perspectives. And I feel that is a bit like the mini, our mini organ, our organization is a bit of a mini democracy in that sense, because all mm. the, the the best of, of, or the benefits of a collective intelligence um, also really come to life in our organization by having uh, diverse perspectives. So that is, I, I would say for sure, kind of, um, something I'm extremely proud of as well as the fact that um, I was actually in the last weeks as uh, I guess for many entrepreneurs were preparing for 2023 doing strategic planning and then um, the, I did a whole lot of customer visits over the past month so I went to different European countries visiting our, our, our clients and um, I'm also pretty proud to see that over the years we have really evolved from at the beginning Seven years ago, Citizen Lab, um, we were more of a like a nice to have tools for local governments to run a project and do something flashy, get citizens involved. But it's fascinating to me to see that we've become a centerpiece in how uh, governments are making decisions and how every single project uh, often comes in, in some cities at least comes um, on our platform to engage with residents, give them the opportunity to, to uh, make their voice heard. So that's something I'm also really proud of uh, the to see that we are becoming almost indispensable for some of the cities I work with. Wow! Yeah, that's that's uh, that's that's amazing. Um, on the on the let's well immediately already segue a little bit from what I intended to uh, to go for <laughs> in this conversation, but the, the 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 fact that you work with uh, twenty different nationalities. Um, what would you say is the is the biggest challenge there? Yeah, that's a good that's that's a that's a really good question because there are challenges to that too. It's not only like all uh, positive. Um, it's we see that for we for a very long time have been a European team, uh, Belgians, uh, Dutchies, uh, uh, Frenchies, and then people from the UK and from Denmark. And um, since about one year, two years, we also have colleagues on the other side of the Atlantic in North America. And first of all, there is time zones, just like not having synchronous collaboration, I would say, but that has nothing to do with culture, but that is just a very practical kind of barrier to, to the most fruitful collaboration, I would say, something you have to deal with. Um, 
but also like it, it's it's pretty fascinating to see the differences between Europe and um, the US, the way that we think about work, the way that we think about our careers, the way that we... Um, so I, I do think that just in, in Europe with our like also strong social security in place, we do see that there are some different values. Um, there's, I think, more attention to like a really good work-life balance to give an example. Um, and so those are like some deeper values that are embedded into cultures that we see expressed in, in our workplace as well. And that is really interesting to adapt to. Um, so that's something that you learn over time as well. First, you get mm -hmm. to make some mistakes. Um, as a, as maybe as a fun example, as a little anecdote here, when we first went out hiring our US team in in Europe, you know, like we have a lot of pay time off, and and it's something that we consider like pretty standard to do as an as an employer to give like 25, 30, uh, 30 days something. Um, and when we went out on the labor market in the US and start hiring our team there, we started doing that at at. On, on day one as well we said okay you know like here's a whole package basically went with the same package out there but you see there are very different expectations and for instance salary wise and in in the us there are higher expectations but then on the benefit side it's typically a bit lower so that is a very kind of practical example uh of something that you have to learn first by doing it and then knowing hmm all right it's it's designed in a different way here hmm interesting um What's the best way you uh, process and learn information with Sun? Oh, for me, it's definitely in a in a textual way. I love getting into a meeting, having a clear note, having a clear like all the information exchange that in a way has happened before the meeting. Everyone's briefed, and they make room for uh, discussions and conversations. Uh, I'm not so much actually like a. Um, auditive learner or or I have a hard time also like actually podcasts and 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 audiobooks is is not, not really my kind of thing. I, I love a good old text and to be able to scan and to be able to control your speed of like taking up that information. Um it allows me to better connect the dots, I think. Hmm. Interesting. So Citizen Lab is like a mini democracy. Uh you're currently doing a lot of uh, conversations with your customers, working on your strategy for next year. Um, different internationalities also bring some challenges like the time zones and the, the different views on, on, on salaries yeah. and, and benefits. And uh, you're a you're a person to person guy who likes uh, clear notes and clarity yeah. and structure. Okay, well, I think we're ready to jump into Citizen Lab then. Um, well, let's start with a very basic question. What is Citizen Lab? What is Citizen Lab? So Citizen Lab, it's an um, online community engagement platform that is uh, currently being used by about 400 governments worldwide to make it easy for their citizens to engage in local politics, local projects, and local uh, policies. Um, so concretely, what does that mean? We offer a digital platform on which you as a resident can go to the platform of your city, have a look at what your government on the one hand might be working on. They might be working on a new climate action plan. They might be working on the new participatory budget for your neighborhoods um, or any other topic that you might be interested in. So mm -hmm. you can on one hand participate in those projects. And then on the other hand, more from the bottom up, you can come with your proposals that you have for your neighborhood or city. Um, activate other people to think along, to, to start mobilizing them, to start voting on each other's ideas and proposals, and really that way make your voice heard so that in the end uh, you have the possibilities and the empowerment to directly influence uh, your local policies. Hmm. So you basically digitalized um, the, the, the town square of Athens uh, 2,500 years ago, something like that. Right, that's that's the idea that we create a new public space, a more um, institutional public space as well than like today there are public spaces by private companies, Twitter and Facebook and social media networks. We are working with governments to create that agora that you're referring to, the public square kind of, where people can come together with different opinions, where they can uh, debate, where they can share their ideas, where they can vote for each other's ideas. Um, so indeed that's, 
for us also the vision in the in the long run we want to make it way more um accessible easy accessible and we want to lower the barriers for people to engage in democracy because democracy should be more than just going out to vote every four five six years how can we get people involved in the more continuous way of participating in democracy and that's what we hope to do by providing uh, the online tools for people um, from wherever they are whenever they want to to participate without having to go to a town hall meeting on a tuesday mm -hmm. night at eight o'clock um because that's okay. also how we get started at the beginning. Um, uh, interesting, and, yeah. Where where did, where did the ID for Citizen Lab come from? Yeah, as, as students in Brussels. Um, so I started together with my two co-founders about seven years ago. And as students in Brussels, we we we, we love the city. As you know, Brussels, <laughs> as any other city, has its problems. Um, and we had ideas for how to solve them, how we could make our neighborhood like a just like a a more fun and more livable and a more beautiful place to live in. Mm -hmm. And then we start looking at what are the different options out here to actually make my voice heard as a citizen of Brussels. And then back then, no kidding, you could go on the city website of the city of Brussels and you could download a PDF form that you could print out, fill out and send per mail, per letter to your to your city government. That okay, that might be fairly... <laughs> doable to do better than this and for people to actually engage in a low barrier in a, yeah, in a lighter way we're using social networks all the time to communicate with each other why would we be able to do that with government and why is government still so outdated um that's how we got started and then we saw the first city showing interest especially in the idea of hey we're really missing out on the young people because we've got you know like always as governments tend to call it the same 10 people in the room you know, like the, the loudest voices, uh, the stereotype goes that it's like the retired people uh, who are frustrated, but who really skew the public opinion. And if you can also engage that silent majority and all those people that are not heard today, then you get a very different perspective as a government as well on what the public opinion would be. Mm -hmm. And that's how we got started. Um, super, from really, super. Yeah, from uh -huh. side project into, into building a business uh -huh. out of it. Ah, uh, cool. Um, I think for um, for the listeners to get a, an even better picture of the application of the platform, I saw on the website five domains in which typically Citizen Lab is involved by governments. Could you just right. simply describe those five domains, please? Yes. So the five domains that we typically work on or that we run projects in are, on the one hand, strategy and budgeting. It's the most important one. So everything, and that is also our goal to be close enough to like the highest level policy decisions. So multi-annual strategies, annual budgets, um, long-term visions for for the city. Those are typically the things that we um, that we do well that we work on with the city. Uh, and then you have the four other domains are more kind of you could say the vertical domains where different departments work on. So it can be climate envi and environment, can be more public planning and public spaces, mm -hmm. um, mobility and infrastructure projects or um, or neighborhood projects that are more focused on like building community, building social cohesion. So those are kind of the four different, um, more vertical domains that we work in. Okay. Just as a side note, do, do you know um, the, co the company called Omgeving? No, no, I don't. Um, then I'll, 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 I'm going to put you in contact with the CEO because they, they are an uh, landscape architects, uh, one of the, the biggest in, uh, in, in, well, at least one of the most famous in the world, even they do projects in Asia. And I know that we, we've worked together and I know that they, uh, intend to integrate, um, the participation of the neighborhood into the project. And so they work also both with governments and with the civilians. So it might be an interesting connection for you guys uh, to, yeah, to set up. Yeah. Um, why do you believe that harnessing the collective intelligence of people is important for governments, but in, gen in general also? Right. Yeah. It starts actually from the belief in um, pluralism that there is not one truth and that 
the diversity of more opinions can better inform your decision making. That is an important uh, initial kind of belief, conviction, or statement that that we start from. Um, in the case of a city, there are so many people daily walking through their neighborhoods, going out in the city, experiencing the city, all in a different way. So they each have different perspectives on, okay, how could I improve my neighborhood or city? Uh, and that's really what we want to unlock, um, having those different perspectives to be able to empathize with each other, to listen to each other, to change your perspective as well, because that is an important idea behind democracy. It's not only about making my voice heard, it's as much about listening to my fellow citizens, hearing what they have to say, and who knows, like transforming my opinion, because that is transformative effect that democracy can have, engaging with each other, entering into dialogue, and um, yeah, potentially changing your, your perspectives. And ultimately, as I said, it's about better informing your public decision making. That is in the end what we want to do. Our, our mission um, also with at Citizen Lab with the idea of a collective intelligence is to make the public decision making more inclusive, people who are underrepresented, giving them a voice and feeling for people to feel more included in decision making. Secondly, uh, to make it more participatory. Um, and thirdly, um, to make governments also more responsive. If you don't listen to, uh, you know, like um, at the, also at the end of the day, like the people experiencing the city, then uh, you cannot never be responsive. So it's not only about giving more people a say in decision making, it's also giving them in the end, giving them an impact and an influence on the decisions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and there's a belief in there that you will end up with better decisions. You will end up with also kind of a buy-in because people right. have been participating in the process and uh, you end up with a government which needs to be responsive to, um, you know, the process kind of imposes them to be responsive to to um, to what the, the the public wants. And in an ideal, I, I, don't, I wonder, do you, I, I love the fact that you also say the, you mentioned empathy and, 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 and listening to each other, which mm -hmm. is uh, going back to the introduction, um, there's a lot of polarization currently, a lot of people stuck in their perspective and not listening. Do you notice in the project that you guys do that you see some kind of improvement in how the participants listen to each other? Do you, do you, is, is that something that you can observe? Right. Something interesting is, and something that we're also hearing a lot from the, the cities that we work with is that the fact that it's an institutional platform, so that it comes from your government, mm -hmm. makes that you have a more um, constructive debate. Overall, we have low levels of, of trolls and spams and everything that you see online on social media. And the mm. idea or the fact that actually it's like a, a, a government-installed um, platform definitely helps to that that you come out as okay I'm, I'm i'm also in your public name they come out as a as a resident of your city it's not like an anonymous participation and that you're accountable for the opinions that you share that that leads to a more constructive debate and conversation is i believe pretty interesting and something to build on okay. um that being said the challenge is for sure how do you make people listen to each other in an online setting? During COVID, we uh, we saw an entire shift from, you know, like town hall meetings and public meetings are still very important for governments. They still really rely on them. So suddenly when COVID hit, they had to shift all their activities from offline to online. And you saw an interesting way to rethink online versus offline, we start talking about synchronous and asynchronous participation. Asynchronous is what we offer with our platform that you, you leave a comment and then maybe 24 hours later, someone else will uh, share an opinion and, and react to you. Um, so it has some benefits that it gives you the time to reflect. It gives you the time to optimally formulate your opinions. But the downside of it is when we talk about empathy, it creates, it doesn't create that much empathy as a face-to-face -face conversation could do. So what we did during um, during COVID is 
focusing also on that synchronous face-to-face -face part. And we built um, a module actually to run online workshops in a facilitated way, like a, you could say a facilitated Zoom meeting where you have dot voting and ideation and all those all those different tools. Mm -hmm. um, because that is really the belief that you need the face, you do need the face to face to complement um, the, the purely online. I'm not a believer in, okay, an online digital platform is going to take over the entire local democracy. I don't believe in that. I think it's mm -hmm. the blend of having that synchronous and asynchronous, that online and that offline that will um, bring us the furthest. Um, but overall, okay. yeah, it's it's really wow. Well, that, that, that's a super interesting learning for decision making processes all across organizations that you that you need to blend the asynchronous with the synchronous, which means presenting proposals online, giving people the time to reflect on it, to to comment on it, and then bringing that together in the right. synchronous uh, format, where which is needed in order to build empathy um uh within the group so wow that's yeah. uh thanks for sharing yeah. that that's super and, interesting and learning the um, in terms of methodology i think an interesting way to think about it as you said is like you can share your proposals up front you can even poll opinions you can hear how people are feeling about something about certain statements and you can actually s sense like okay we've got before you enter into that face-to-face -face conversation, you can say, hey, we've got 90% kind of consensus and agreement on maybe that this is important, that is important, that is important. So let's focus on the other 10% where we have a divergence of opinions and let's explore each other's arguments, the pros, the cons, let's deliberate and let's inform ourselves here. So it's yeah. also an intuitive way that you can blend that, that um, asynchronous with the synchronous part. Yeah, so so up, up front of the face-to-face, you can say, okay, these topics we agree on, we park that, and then in the face to face, you 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 focus on the disagreements. Oh, interesting. Right. Um, could you? Uh, so okay, uh, we 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 are we are getting the picture. What I'd like to do now is zoom in on one specific project, and yeah. then play a little bit devil's advocate. Okay. okay. So maybe sure. maybe yeah. start by uh, sketching us. Um, one specific project that you've done. Yeah. Let's take the example of, because I think it's one of the, the most creative approaches or one of the most innovative approaches, it's the idea of participatory budgeting. So basically allocating budget in a participatory way in which you first, there's like a multi-step approach. In the first phase, you're going to collect ideas from your residents uh, as a city. So um you're going to hear like, okay, how do you want to improve your neighborhood? Uh, we've got maybe a million or 500,000 to spend. So we're going to first start by collecting your ideas. What are things that you want to see improved? Um, then typically you go to second phase where, we're gonna, where you're going to do project development. So after the first phase, the city is often going to, gonna, with all those ideas collected, let's say we've got about 200 ideas for your neighborhood. We're going to try to first put them together. Um, how we SitLab will help there is our, uh, we are using some text analytics in our in our uh, in the backend. They will actually detect the similarities. And they will say, hey, here are a lot of people talking about safer streets. Here they are talking about the lack of greenery and we want more, maybe also more room for kids to play. So we will detect kind of those bigger um, priorities and actually suggest people to collaborate and merge those different ideas into projects and that would be a second step project development um so you're actually and that is again where that's a that's a good moment for a face-to-face -face moment to say hey here are all the people who had those ideas and feel strong about having you know like more space for their kids to play in the neighborhood well here let's develop a project together and then they start developing the project and start thinking about what would be needed, what would potentially be the budget that is needed and so on. And then you get into the, the so, and then you end up with, let's say we got from our 200 ideas to about um, 20 different projects that have been developed. And then you get to the third step, which is the, the voting part, the participatory budgeting. So the way that we do that is um, you would have that half million, let's say, You've got the 20 projects, but if you take the sum of all those 20 projects, you would be at a budget of 10 million. 
So you have to make choices. And it's a very playful way for also people to realize that um, resources are finite and mm -hmm. that you have to work under restrictions as a government to involve them and to sensibilize them in, in really a decision maker's way of thinking. And ask them, would you rather like do that big project here to have that new playground that's going to cost us about 450,000 and then maybe you have some left for maybe large chessboard, whatever in, 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 the, in the playground, or would you rather distribute it over some smaller projects? So that is uh, something that we see happening a lot uh, these days, participatory That's budgeting. Cool. We're doing it for climate actions as well, um, because a lot of cities have their climate action plan ready, but now they're they're, they're asking the residents, okay, we've got uh, like a fund of 200,000 to invest in climate actions. Which actions can we take together? Um, and uh, that's how they promote people to take action as well in their neighborhoods. Okay. And then the last phase is, is obviously following the implementation of the projects that have been chosen. Okay. So I see a lot of, well, super interesting insights and parallels between what you guys are doing with governments and what um, is, a, is a very important trend in uh, corporate organizations where, where, where basically leadership of corporate organizations are thinking about the same things. How can we involve our people in the strategic process? How can we make our budget more transparent and, and agile? So there's a lot of comparisons. So now I'm gonna sit my sit, I'm gonna sit in the chair of the rather uh resistant corporate leader who says, like, yeah, but oh, I mean, my people they don't have the skills to discuss budget right. what would be what would be your response how do you how do you view that well um maybe they're right as in maybe indeed they don't have the skills but that's also not the point as in um the, the idea of the budget that i that i that i shared is in the first place you want also people in who are part of the process as i said you want them to think along in understanding the restrictions and, and the limited resources that you're working with, the scarce resources. Maybe the point isn't to get like the exact kind of breakdown of what the cost would be. It's more about having them to think about what it would cost. And then you you still have, that's why we have experts and that's why we live in a world with specializations because there will this financial controller, uh, there will be the financial controller who will come in and say, hey, you forgot this or you overestimated it and, and you can correct, but it's more about the process and taking people along in the mindset, sharing really the, 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 the yeah, kind of the, the dilemmas that decision makers and leadership has to, to work under mm -hmm. and created yeah. that empathy and understanding of of hey we get to collectively make some harsh decisions trade offs um, and choosing is losing and so if you kind of bring people into that process there will be way more understanding and support at the end of the process. Mm -hmm. So in in a sense, what you're saying, Whitson, is that um, the participants don't have to be don't have to have a, a major in business finance. Uh, the goal of their participation is to to use their insights on what the, the the customers are saying and what the organization needs according to them, and then invite them to think on priorities within the restrictions of a financial number, and that's it. Yeah, right. yeah. Wow. Yeah, I I love the answer. Um, how do you guys? I mean, yeah. How, how do you cope with the bureaucracy that is inherent to, well, both government organizations, but also corporate organizations? Mm -hmm. um, is that a blocking factor? And if so, how do you, how do you deal with that? It can be for sure. Um, but we also try to internalize that and try to, of course, understand how we can affect that. And uh, I see there on, on your background, Nick, change change maker change management change bringing change to an organization starts from what we've seen when it comes to citizen participation if you want to institutionalize that and if you want to make it part of your day-to-day -day processes it's not about running one cool flashy project it's about putting the foundations and the structure in place upon which a culture of participation can build 
and that the culture that will come rather organically, but that foundation, that structure won't. So that's where we always start um, with how are we going to organize that? And, and that is, I find it one of the most fascinating parts about local government, that you have all those different departments, often as in a corporate organization, often working in silos. And if you think about participation, it's like a city that I work with has called it, it's a service for the services. So it's an overarching horizontal kind of way of doing things that needs to be embedded into the way of doing it in every single department. So it needs to be decentralized. It needs to be decentralized to be effective. If you if you centralize and you've got one team doing it, it's never going to work. It's just like, in my opinion, I don't know how you think about it. It's just like a strategy team or something or an innovation uh, team. Something fully you agree. Get into your uh, culture, into your. And I'm, I'm curious. So, as you mentioned, the, the the different silos is something you encounter also in local governments. Um, you also mentioned it's the most interesting phase of the project for you. Uh, what do you do to break those to bring the break those silos down, and to to really inspire them with this concept of decentralization? What is the, I would say, what is the which which words which action really do you see really having an impact on their on their siloed mindset concretely showing examples of other cities because governments they can get inspired by peers so if you show examples of peers and if you show a little bit of competitive benchmarking as in like hey look what they are doing look what how, how it's also possible to do it then it gives a lot of credibility to your work um, because there is still in industries that are a bit more, let's say, um, typically following kind of the herd, then uh, it's it's really effective if you have good case studies and inspiring examples. So that that's the primary thing um, that we focus on, really showing okay. inspiring examples and showing yeah. that it's possible. Okay. Um, next uh, devil's advocate argument. It's like, guys, another digital platform i mean it takes us uh, two months to get a, a new laptop here with the it infrastructure that we have yeah. and you you're asking us to come to install a new digital platform yeah what's your view on that um that's that's also probably a good point and that's why we as citizen lab um focus a lot on being that kind of having a vision of a 360 hub and trying to bring all the parts together, uh, seeing ourselves as a, as a way to also centralize all participation, because that is what's happening, at least when it comes to participation in the city today, what is happening is that it's very scattered across departments. So again, that's why we're getting back to, in the first place, that internal structure and that, that organization, that every single department does their participation in the same and consistent way, and that it's mm -hmm. not like, scattered all over here we're using a survey tool and there we're doing offline meetings and here we're going over social networks and, and so on so that is something we're trying to do centralize it offer like one central um hub and one central portal for all things participation even if the participation isn't done through citizen lab so that's the first thing and then secondly integrating the data so that the data flows between the different tools and you build efficient workflows for um the cities when you when we explain what we do, then obviously there is a um, kind of a, a, a public impact impact side to that and the citizen side, and that is the most recognizable for us all. But there is that part is only the tip of the iceberg, the engagement with the residents. What's really underneath is to be effective and to have that engagement being effective and having an influence. It's all about those foundations below. It's about what you do in your backend, how the data flows, how efficient you make it for governments to report on the data, how it's integrated with their other tools. And that's what we're paying a lot of um, attention to. To the usability of the platform. Yeah. yeah, right. So it's indeed, as you said, it's just not yet another tool, but do you really think about workflow efficiency for the public servants have to use in their day to day? Mm -hmm. Okay. Ready for one more? Yes, shoot. Yeah. Um, yeah, we tried this before and it's always the same participants that join. It's always the same people that uh, that come to these uh, town halls that we organize. And uh, 
right <laughs> so yeah, what's what's the good. point it's a good one um yeah and then you have to think about okay the way that i engage them the way that i reach out to them maybe that's also always the same um and what, do you have do you have practice? best practices in terms of reaching out to so how how does if you launch this project yeah. what's the best way for a local government to to reach out to their civilians to participate what's is there is there a best practice there uh i think i'll have a disappointing answer here because it's um there is no silver bullet there is really no single answer it depends on also your goals are you indeed focused on inclusion on accessibility then maybe you should have your your communication in multiple languages and you should uh and that is something that we europeans i think we can learn a lot from what's happening in in the us with quite a focus on diversity equity and inclusion they will communicate it will go out in the field go out in the neighborhoods have work with translators have people um, participate in their native language so you will see our platforms being available in vietnamese in in mandarin in korean and all different languages when you go for instance to the platform of, of the city of seattle um they work with so that is a first thing language mm -hmm. and language accessibility um something that we still in europe haven't taken a strong perspective on well, or like in europe even, even in belgium if you think about uh right <laughs> the, ch the challenges that come yes. with uh having three languages in uh yeah, if you yeah. have an organization across belgium you, you have three languages yeah. and you know it's it's okay. hard to explain when you go to the us and then you say yeah in my city I, I live i come from a from a town right outside of brussels and um there's probably going to be about i would say 30 percent of the population that is french speaking but it's a flemish town but of course, like, I mean, that is a the territory principle of, okay, this, mm. you know, like here, this soil here, we speak that language and no other language is accepted, but it's a, in terms of inclusion, accessibility, I mean, we can, it's more of a political debate, but anyways, I think mm. it's a, it's, it's a great practice to see that um, engaging in different languages is one. Secondly, thinking about, um, yeah different ways to to reach them we are using uh for instance in the in the us we're using quite a bit of texting um texting is often still being being used we're also going to build now um why we are building why do they be... often often use texting as a as an easy accessible way for to to reach out to people to be also yeah. very maybe not of... everybody has a, the, the latest iphone but almost everybody has a exactly. phone that can text even my grandmother has a phone that can text. So right. with, yeah. in that way, you 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 reach also maybe uh, more marginal uh, groups yeah, of it's the population. Bit, it's a dumb way of of um, of of, of yeah, participation, doing outreach, and making sure that everybody everybody understands uh, like how text works and can participate. Um, but the last one I want to something I want to add here, Nick is really going out in the city and that's something that uh, that I'm particularly excited about for the next years is thinking about this idea of um, what some would call digital participation physical plus digital going out in the public spaces and when you have like a construction site where there's going to be like a new park whatever that you have um, in the neighborhoods that you have devices for people to actually make their voice heard and to participate I'm excited about that because I'm I'm curious how that would help us indeed get people to participate that typically won't go to an online platform if it's if it's kind of on their way to work and if it's in your kind of daily flow of experiencing the city then we might hear also some other voices so that's something I'm I'm okay. uh, curious about but in general it's really about Taking a my, my short answer would be taking a multimodal approach and not assuming that everybody will come online and, and go on their desktop on a Tuesday night to participate. Yes, some will do that, but if you only rely on that assumption, then you will get more of the same. So you get to mm -hmm. engage by a different ways. Um and for the older people who still enjoy going to the town hall over a cup of coffee to explain their ideas, well, let's also serve them in that way. Mm -hmm. Okay. Crystal clear. Last one, um, we'd say this is fantastic for smaller decisions, but when the stakes are high or in, I mean, forget it. I mean, this goes, this is too slow. 
uh, the decisions. Uh, there's a there's a, a high need for consensus, which will not happen. Yeah. Um, so for high stake decisions, mm, let's let's centralize. Yeah. Well, the problem that you end up with if is if you didn't make it a participatory process and if you didn't involve the stakeholders, so everyone who has a stake in the decision, if you don't involve them as from the start or early enough, then they will backfire at the end because what you will see is you will delay your 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 big projects and big decisions because you don't have any buy-in. People will start complaining. You turn things in a very into a very negative vibe and you don't create ambassadors and those mm -hmm. ambassadors are important like the people who participate in your process and actually you who help uh, create that legitimacy and support for your decisions they are key because then it feels like a shared decision so in other words mm -hmm. like if, if you don't so do you, that, you, the, you you kind of you just postpone the problem and by postponing it you potentially make it even bigger you you spend right. all this time and energy in creating uh, in coming to a strategic decision, for example, but then if nobody adopts it, well, then right. then you you're, you're nothing left. Yeah, exactly. And I think there are some good examples now of, in many cities around the world, but also in in Belgium, um, of cities implementing new mobility plans um, and facing a lot of like uh, backlash and a lot of protests these days because we weren't able to involve enough people early enough in the decisions and now the decisions are made and are implemented and you start seeing that people really disagree and it becomes pretty violent in the tone and then you're you're getting a bifurcation of the public opinion you get like government against residents and it creates such a such a gap of of uh, distrust in government that we absolutely need to avoid mm, yeah yeah what, I, what the insight that i now have is that even if people are in the process and the final decision is not in line with that with what they believe it should be then still during the process they get Absolutely. views on the other opinions they get view on why the why's and the reason behind of these decisions which make it makes it easier to swallow even if it's an, a decision that you disagree with um, and whereas if, if it just drops on your plate like this is the decision with no, um, uh, with no context and no information. Well, that just triggers defensive, uh, automatically defensive, a defensive reaction. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I think you said something important that it's not about being right; it's about being part of that process and 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 being involved in decision making. It's not about it's about being hurt. And it's not about being followed in, 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 and that's also important for a decision maker to know that. So what we are doing, it's, it's not, I'm also not a big fan of that actually of, of having a direct democracy in which whatever would come on such an online platform is going to make the decision making. No, we have political leaders. We have leaders, leadership to set a direction, to hear people out, to facilitate and to set a direction, to show long-term uh, direction. But there's still an important role in curating those different opinions and setting out like that vision. Mm -hmm. So the one doesn't kind of exclude the other. Um, and strong leadership, in my opinion, for 21st century is a leadership style that is participatory, that engages people in the process, but still where you set a clear direction. Um, and we yep. need that as well. Yeah, it's the definition of uh, clear leadership, strong leadership in the 21st century. Okay, Witsa, I'm, I'm, I'm also being mindful of, of, of time, and I, I think we already covered quite a lot in this conversation. So, I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, ask you one more uh, final question to, to conclude the conversation. Um, so, our customers, a lot of our customers and our, our listeners, are in a transition from the classic command and control top-down organization which worked fantastic in the 20th century um, but now needs to be adopted to the world we live in today um, and as I mentioned a big trend in that transition is more participative decision making um, the most used excuse to fall back on top-down decision making is that people believe that it's too slow so we already touched it a little bit on it 
in the previous question, but I, I'd like to zoom in on the on the the speed uh, aspect. Um, what are your what are your what what is a typical timeline of the decision making? Is there a typical timeline, and is it so that it's slower and that you gain it back in the execution? Is that the main the main driver, or are there other aspects in terms of speed that we're forgetting? Mm -hmm. um, indeed, we touched on it already. I think like the uh, when talking about speed, you you shouldn't think about the time it takes to make a decision. You should be thinking about the time also after the decision and see it way more to see it way more broadly. You you got to see it as the time to my outcome, not the time to my decision. And then mm -hmm. if you think about it that way, and not only the time, because time is one aspect, also the effectiveness, of course, of the outcome. Um, but if you think about it that way, then I think that makes a much stronger case for for part for making people participate more broadly. So, uh, as we said before on the, on, the, on the previous question, indeed, like it will backfire if you if you don't engage people early enough. And the strongest thing that you can do also in a corporation is create internal ambassadors, create people who are enthusiastic about a strategy, who, who get the possibility to, to think along and who, who want to work on it, who are motivated to implement that strategy. And mm -hmm. if you do it all top down way, that's not going to happen. Do you have any experience with local governments who use Citizen Lab um, in times of crisis and linked to decision making, linked mm -hmm. to a decision which was linked to a crisis? Because that's also often a reason to fall back on this yeah. very controlled top down. Now it's leadership. Now it's a crisis. We need fast, centralized, strong, decisive leadership. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah and, and that is indeed like i mean what i'm thinking about is of course climate and i'm happy to see that we're we're not at that stage yet because that is going to be a very interesting question once it's getting too late are we going to get to like an ecological dictatorship you know like where we have to take actions that's not a matter of like let's hear what people think can we change our minds quickly enough to also think those are the, the bigger interests i think it's that question is going to be for the future a very relevant one. Um, I'm trying to we think have of pro examples. projects linked to the Corona crisis, for example. Indeed, that, that's a good example where I do think that in general things get or decisions get made from a very um, yeah you know, top down perspective, and there wasn't a public debate really about okay. Are we okay with this in terms of the measures being taken and and and, and privacy wise and so on? So it got imposed as a it's a must do thing, um, but I think we we lacked because there are multiple. We all agreed on like how we where we should get to, and of course like uh, decreasing like exposure to each other and so on, um, and protecting public health. But there are still multiple ways to get there, and I do think it it was a missed opportunity to take people along in that conversation and what are the different ways to get there and and that has also backfired and is still backfiring where there's a whole group that has this like the, the whole anti-vaxxer movement mm -hmm. uh, that is i think not that marginal that also comes from that and i'm not gonna say that <laughs> that that would have solved everything if we would have a public debate about it but i do think it was a missed opportunity to also have a larger debate about how do we mm. actually get to those outcomes yeah yeah so uh, we conclude with that you it's also your your conviction that even for decisions in times of crisis or maybe especially for decisions in times of crisis because they're so important we need to find way to um, to involve um, the right. participants and the public okay it's a, that's a great one to conclude i thank you so much i mean this was such an inspiring 45 minute talk um our listeners are gonna love it i guarantee it thank you so much <laughs> thanks so much nick for having me 